Okay, welcome folks. This is House Corrections and Institutions Committee. It is Tuesday, January 9th, and it's the first day back um, for the full week of full work, and we're going to start out with Ben of Agroski. Ben is going to quickly walk through us. We have this on our webpage, and this is Performa, however you pronounce it. Um, every year there are reports that um, it's most it's a house government house government operations committee is the one that really looks they do the review, yeah. they do the review of a lot of reports that are out there, um, and they have those the respective committees look at those reports that are in that that committee's purview on whether or not we continue receiving these reports or we say no we don't need it anymore and then government operations will take it off the books. So it's just a way of cleaning things up every year for that. So Ben has offered to help a little bit because there may be some overlap here <clears throat> with the Judiciary Committee on some of these reports. So I'm going to turn it over to you, Ben, and if you could just, when you do have a memo, or you don't, there's, this came from, this came from GovOps. Yeah. Um... Well, for the record, my name is Ben Novogratsky. I'm from the Office of Legislative Counsel. Um, so to expand on what uh, Chair Emmons just said, so this is done really as a cleanup uh, for some reports that basically the, the key question for all of you today is whether a legislative required, work, a required report is necessary to continue on for your legislative work. So when we're kind of going through this, just ask yourselves, have we used this? How will we use this? Will we need to use this in the future? Um, so we'll go through that. I've sort of done a, a quick look at some of the reports that have that overlap with the Judiciary Committees. There are only four of them, um, and there are a few more facing the committee. But if you look at the spreadsheet that I believe you, you all have. It's, um, it's on our web page and we have paper. This is one side, and this is the other. Yep. You're talking more about the green side, right? Well, both sides. Both sides? Yeah, I mean, so we just need to kind of go through all these because I think that there was a little bit of lag in doing this in the past. That's why there's some that are beyond the five year mark. Um, but going through this, is we just need to, the committee needs to notate, do we want to repeal the requirement? Do we want to basically reinstitute it for another five year term or do we want to retain it permanently? Because by default, unless the report, a report through legislation um, is exempted from 2 VSA 20 D, all reports expire after five years. So this is sort of to take a look at that. Mm -hmm. So any questions about sort of the, the task before the committee? <clears throat> So why would the 2017 months not have expired? Uh, well, they're, they're still on the books, but the, that's why we're sort of okay. doing this is to clean them up, to take them off the books unless we, unless but the committee- But it's beyond five it. years. Right, I, I think there's a little bit of a lag. Um, why, COVID yeah, why some of these are still, still on there. Um, so the ones that I took a look at as far as have reports been filed or what they are is, um, Bear with me a minute. <clears throat> so one is the uh, evaluation of goals and performance of pretrial services report, which is required to be submitted by DOC. Um, so I believe that is on the top of the second page. That expired last year, or two years ago, excuse me. Um, and it was filed annually between 2015, or no, I'm sorry, uh, no record of this report has been filed, um, though AHS did file a report in 2016, but it didn't come from DOC, so wasn't sure if it was the same. Um, there are annual reports from the Attorney General's Office on court diversion and pretrial services beginning in 2017, but nothing that came from DOC. So I never got anything ever from DOC. Not that I could find. I did not do an extensive search, though. What you found of some reporting from the AG's office? Uh, yeah, but the, whether or not it's under the same requirement is kind of an open question. So the pretrial services, when we first put that in place, was administered through DOC. 
and the report was required to be through DOC. Because it was administered, the pretrial services were administered through DOC. When we put that in place, must have been back 17, and then it was, we were finding, I don't know how long after that, we found that it really should be housed in the Attorney General's office. So that we might be. pulled it out of DOC. So that might explain that. So that explains why there's nothing from DOC, because they no longer have jurisdiction of the pretrial services. Right. Would we have had to change the language for them, or designated them to do it? Probably, and that would have been whenever that change happened. And I do know that the Attorney General's office in the diversion statutes, they have a reporting requirement. And so a lot of times trial services, all of those sort of, um, you know, community supports and diversion are sort of collectively dealt with together. So perhaps they were all. So we don't know if there's any evaluation of the pretrial services at all. So I guess the question is, do you still want to keep the requirement on DOC to submit it? Or do you want to make it permanent? Or do you want to repeal it? Well, if they never did. Yeah, I mean, if they're not in charge of it, then we ought to repeal the report. The question is, I then go to the next question, is it important to have an evaluation of the pretrial service? And the pretrial services for folks, this is for folks who weren't here, it says sequential intercept model, where a person is um, prior to being going to trial, they have some opportunities to work with the courts, they can work with their community justice centers, they can work with a person to slip them into some slots into treatment or substance use disorder treatment or mental health treatment. They can do that work prior to going towards um, trial and be successful, then it really helps in their sentence. They have a lower sentence, they may not be incarcerated, and maybe on the path of recovery. Uh, just curious if the bill that Rep. Dolan came in here with has any reporting requirements in that. Because it does. It's right here. So that's my bill. Yeah. <laughs> I'll be living with this. It does have reporting yes. evaluations. Uh, not, I don't know if it's the same exact requirements as, as this bill, but it does have reported requirements. Okay. So one of the issues that came up when pretrial services were first uh, put in place was that um, from a defense perspective, we were concerned about lack of confidentiality when we're asking criminal defendants to share information with someone who doesn't <laughs> hold any kind of confidentiality measures. So um, we really had a hard time with that. I think it did get worked out in a way that was acceptable and, and it was put into place, but that was one of the early uh, issues that we saw uh, that involved it. These people would go into, at arraignment, go in and meet with a criminal defendant who was there for possibly the first time, didn't know uh, the ropes and could very definitely have confessed or made statements that would have been uh, counter to their interest in a criminal case. So um, that was, you know, I, again, I think it got worked out, but um, I don't know. I, I left, but that was the issues. Um, at least in diversion, I do know that there's a, an exception that any yes. they disclose and that diversion cannot is. be used. Yep. Yeah. Right, in diversion, yes, but I wasn't sure in pretrial services someone was meeting with a criminal defendant before they got a chance to speak to an attorney so we've got 15 minutes before doug comes in we got more reports okay. so wayne and then mary so um it sounds like it, it could have, there could have been statute changes that assigned it to the ag's office if that's the case We can, but if, if the Attorney General's office is already submitting the report, there's definitely a statutory requirement to do that. They wouldn't just do that on there. The question is, are we gonna ask DOC to continue doing the report right. on something they don't have? No, because right. they never did. Is it 2.30? Right. Oh, they never did. 2.30, I thought it was 2. Never, but we have more time. That was the one, so I say yeah. So we repeal it? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. 
Okay. So Doug is in at 2.30, sorry. <laughs> okay, next one. Um, so again, I'm just kind of starting with the ones that had the crossover and then we can go. So the next one is uh, the second one on, this, on the second page, um, pre-charge program uh, report. Um, again, state's attorneys was required to submit it no record of any report filed, but again, the uh, AG's office has submitted reports, so like further evidence that they're they're handling these reports now. So that's all part of the pre-charge. Yeah, it was pre-trial. Representative Fox, I think, had her bill. Yeah. So who checks? Oh. So who actually checks to see if these reports are filed as they are in statute to do, and then they're not? Legislature. <laughs> <laughs> it's us. Yeah. And, and, Subcommittee. And where is this? <laughs> and there is a list that came out from Legislative Council of all the reports that uh, are due with the statutes. So we can go through this so people are interested, so they can go through it. Let's see. Where do they reside? Legislative Council. All right, it's not a lot of them are sometimes they go directly to a committee. It depends how the language is written in the bill. Pardon? Electronic forms also. Most of them are submitted exactly. electronically. Um, if you do on the website, it has the, the General Assembly's website does have a link to Bills and reports. I mean, bills and reports. Yeah, exactly. Reports and research under the main tabs, and then you can find legislative reports either through keyword or they're they're chronological. But it's not comprehensive because it doesn't go all the way back in time. Doesn't go. And these are reports that are due to our committee. Some is just to our committee. Some is to our committee with a lot of other committees at the same time. So we have a lot of pages here of reports that are due to us. So if people want to look at this, you're more than welcome. So quite often in legislation, we want to report back. And then the question is, we get the report back. Do we even know we're getting the report? Do we look at it? Did we even get it? it did we even get it? So the pre-charge program is very similar to the pre-trial. Hasn't been filed. Do we keep it? Do we feel it? This committee want to do it lens somewhere. We give it another year or two. I can I, I can say that in H six forty five there are reporting requirements to do with pre charge and that. So if this is repealed, it potentially will come back. Be reinstituted just in a different form and different obligations. But any folks want to suggest we repeal it? Sure, being that there's never been a repeal. Yeah. Well, those were the two overlapping reports that I had put together. Otherwise, um, we're all looking at this fresh. As far as, far as fresh goes. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I could suggest that, you know, as we go through them, I can try and pull them up and give a brief description of what they do. Uh -huh. um, I just bear. Sick. No, no. A little bit of patience as I get everything. <laughs> okay. Well, let's continue down on this sheet. This page, okay. So, so we have from VHCB reports that are due about its activities and finances of the preceding year. And that we do get those reports because we get them as we take testimony from VHCB, they always submit a report. And we hear some of that when we hear their testimony when they come in for their capital bill appropriation. This is something we want to retain. This is, seems really relevant. Retain or make permanent? Or you do another, you would do this in five years again if you didn't make a permit. Let's retain it because with all the changes in housing, you yeah. yeah, mm -hmm. may want to readdress it. So maybe retain it. That's just my humble. I agree with you. 
Next. The next one is um, submitted by DOC um, about temporary employees employed at the department. Ever get a report? Boy, this is quarterly. Yes. <laughs> Holy mackerel! I, you know, this was a big issue years and years, and this yeah. is all part of Act One Fifty Four, wasn't it? Yep. Well, this is 163, this one. Yeah, but it came. 154. It says Act 154. It's from the 2022. Oh, the. It's amended. Looking at the initial one. We would be able to see. Well, that was the what, report. What's that the was issue? the report. The issue was we, there was a time that there were a lot of temps that were hired over. Uh, full-time employees because they don't get the bennies right and corrections was hiring an awful lot of temps and that was a real issue in this building and a real issue for the vsca and a real issue for folks working in corrections that they were under practice of hiring temps instead of full fdes for that you could find one report from 2015 about it. Eight years later. <laughs> but it was a big issue back then. I don't think it's such such an issue now. It hasn't come up. Especially with the uh, job market. That's a lot what folks like to do. I mean, how hard is it to put together? Isn't it just a workforce report? You kind of like do a, do a search. This them? one's 119 pages. <laughs> and that was quarterly it was supposed to be? Yeah. I explain why there's only one. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like if you see one last thing. I would say yeah, repeal. I'd say repeal. I think they have bigger fish to fry than this at this point. During the yeah, it's not much of an issue. Given the appropriations or whatever, if they're looking at positions that are going to show up. They're going to be asking you know, those kinds of things, whether permanent employees or temporaries or limited term. They repeal it. Yes. Oh, our 10 year capital construction program. Oh, that's important. Do we make that permanent? Yes. Or do we extend? If you retain, does that, that so makes it permanent. So the 10 year program that is updated every year? It's yeah. Uh, I think it's provided alongside the budget. Right. It's the binder, essentially. Yeah. Well, I think it's a useful, very useful document. To extend or retain. Retain. Okay. Just do it permanently because that's part of our budgeting process. You need to know what's in the pipeline. What is this one? 2018. It's next one. Let me, uh, Notice of any grants awarded to chairs from public safety. <laughs> Would that an 18 just unconditionally just uh give me a moment i'll if it happens, happens. if an event occurs like, oh sure it might not be it might not happen every year or something. this was a committee bill a what bill it was a capital this was through the capital bill in 2018. so with the schools putting section 26. be an 18. chairs of <laughs> chairs of what institutions committee two committees we do that. Hmm. No, and it was in the it, capital bill? It's not the correct citation. Is, that when, is it the schools? When, what, you know, we had some security issues that we beefed School up. School safety and security right, capital yes, grant program. That's what it is. So that started, right. I think that was the year, right. right. That was the year we started to put some 
Money and things and safety. Yeah, right. school safety, right? It was to enhance school safety and security yeah. um, through grants. Is uh, that an 18 that we did that? It was that long ago? Yeah, that's when all those, uh, all the uh, fire. I thought it was later than that. I, would, I mean, that's no longer in effect. And there was there was a big bump there for two years, and that's why we wanted to know what was going on. And I, I think the reason why it's called on condition is that it's only providing notice to the committee whenever they're awarded the grants themselves. So it's as we don't do it anymore. Oh, well, repeal it. We're not doing it anymore. It was just for a short period of happened. time. Then repeal. Because it's not a line item anymore in our capital budget. And it's beyond the two year reallocations. We're gonna know about it. Yeah, it's it's session law. Yeah, I would repeal it because that was a little because we were really concerned what those capital dollars are gonna be used for in the schools. And this was all new to the schools, and it was the Department of Public Safety that was administering the, the dollars. And it went on for about two or three years. Yeah, it doesn't, I'm not seeing a time limit on this. All right. But. But we don't have a line item in our capital bill anymore for that. So I'd repeal it. Okay. First page. Orphan systems. I think we keep this because that's all part of our uh, capital bill appropriation when we deal with the Clean Water Revolving Loan Fund and the orphan revolving system. Revolving Loan Fund. Yeah. Yeah. My favorite words. My favorite words. I would say extend. extend. I would extend. say extend. This got moved. So the next one is. Uh, did we ever get any reports? Um, I can I can check. On what, the orphan? Yeah, if we probably do during our capital budgeting time. Uh, the next one, I think, goes. Let's have a report. The telecommunication authority. We don't do that. We used to put in capital dollars into expanding our broadband. And it went to the telecommunication. Communications authority and that authority is now defunct, doesn't it? Didn't it get moved someplace? Not sure. I think it got moved somewhere. Yeah, I would say repeal it because it doesn't exist. Anymore, so. We used to fund a lot of broadband through the capital bill. Uh -huh. Not that it won't happen again. Okay. The next one is the implementation of potable water and wastewater rules, number and type of alternative or innovative systems uh, that are approved for general use, pilot project, or experimental use. That's all part of our clean water revolving water fund stuff. So I would say extend. Extend. And yes. Oh. Do we have such shelters? Yep, well, we funded those through the capital bill in the past. Did we this time, this year? Yeah. But we have in the past. What really has replaced this a little bit maybe has been transitional, more transitional housing beds and also shifting with justice reinvestment too to really work with um, the victim as well as the offender of domestic violence but this was a request from certain parts of the state for domestic violence shelters and i i don't know if the money came through vhcb i think the money came through vhcb for this that was before this was quite a while ago and by improvements, you mean structural uh -huh. facility improvements? Sorry about that. No, it's okay. I'll, I'll check. Mm. 
2010. It was way back. We did this. Remember the last time we funded such a shelter? Out of Ten years. I was going to say it's ten years. Taxing my memory, Troy. <laughs> those, those are private. They're, they're not EGS. So that one's listed twice. It's listed at the bottom, too. Right, then it was amended in 2017 and postponed to 2020. So we extended it, right? In 17, we extended it. Seeing any reports on this, there are like, DV fatality review commission reports, but it's from a different entity. Yes, yeah, we don't fund it anymore. Repeal both of them. Yes. Two of them there, that one and the one at the very bottom. The same thing. So then the next one is from DOC implementation of notice of community placements during the preceding 12 months. And that is by statute. What is 104E? Um, 104 goes through like the commissioner's duties, um, but I'm going to double check that for you. <clears throat> yeah, because those are all the administrators. I mean, it's 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 literally entitled notification of community placement. So, provide notice when appropriate and at the department's sole discretion to affected state, county, and local criminal justice entities and to all to local legislative bodies for the purposes of public input, enhancing offender reintegration into the community whenever an offender is released under furlough after serving a sentence of incarceration in a correctional facility. Notice may include the offender's name and any aliases, a recent photograph and physical description, community placement address, criminal history, current offense or offenses, home address, uh, plus a description and license plate number of any motor vehicle used by the offender. Uh, any offender? They're on furlough. For, yeah, furloughed offenders. They're on furlough. But does that report come just to us? It says annually to HCI and Senate institutions. We don't. Implementation of this section during the previous 12 months. We've never received a report. Um, I mean, maybe we have, we don't look at it. <laughs> we'll try and do a quick search. Do a quick search and just see. I think some of this may have all come about where people were concerned that folks who were convicted of sex offenses and being re-entering into the communities, being placed near schools, being placed near child care centers, and just looking at those community placements. I have a hunch that may be where this came from initially. It's my hunch, because some people wanted to put out publicly the name of the person, their address where they were residing, and the legislature said no to that. So I'm just wondering if this is as a result of trying to address those concerns. Okay. 
not seeing it. <clears throat> Should we repeal it? Extend it? <clears throat> Retain it? Extend it. Mm -hmm. What use would you have for it? The heads up of well, one of the problems with this program was, and we had some issues in my community, they never, they were supposed to, by law, notify the police. They didn't have to notify neighbors or that, but they had to notify the police. They never did that, and then the activities were off the charts that were going on. And, um, I mean, that was a number of years ago. Yeah, that was in the late 90s, early two, when they had apartment buildings. Right, and they just crammed with no supervision or that, kept saying they were supervised with just, you know, the parole folks going around once a week. It was not pretty. So I'm sure this is an extension of that, but I think possibly to extend it, maybe to see. I know there's another subsection in this. It says the department, again, just more notice to the relevant entities in the area um, for public input um, at the point at which the department has made arrangements to house in any apartment, duplex, or other kind of housing of three or more offenders. If the housing concern was not previously used to house offenders, such an order shall be given at least 15 days prior to placing any offender in such housing. And if the housing concern had previously housed one or two offenders, right. such an order shall be given at least 15 days prior so lucky, a third offender. Two, they had crammed 10 into an apartment. Right. Should have only had seven if that. It's not pretty. Are these properties that are just run by DOC? Is that what that's referring to? Just apartments anywhere. Yeah, because the purpose of this is everything is grounded in, you know, enhancing reintegration into the community. Okay. You so. want to do that, but you need to have some knowledge of what's going on instead of getting calls from a gazillion constituents going, mm -hmm. what's going on in that house? You know, and the police didn't even know. So we got that information, it would actually potentially be useful to know, but we haven't been getting it. I mean, I can think of, of several group housing situations where people are released, but I've never been notified of anything as a legislator about any of those in my county. So I haven't either, though I know of some. I mean, there's sort of contingent language, but it's, the contingency should have gone into effect at this point, so. But we, we could ask. Right, we can ask, but the question right now, do we repeal it, extend it, or retain it? Extend it or extend it, and then we can ask. Because the C is coming in. The, these answers only need to be submitted on the, by the 19th, so you do have a few days if you want to do some investigation. So we are having corrections in tomorrow. And uh, we, this is, it's, a, is it tomorrow? Tomorrow at one. Yeah, tomorrow afternoon. So it's a check-in with questions. So those could be something we can ask. So should we kind of hold up, like put a pin in that one until tomorrow? Yep. Okay. DGS condition of property management revolving fund. We should have that. I would just say retain that one permanently. That's all part of understanding BGS and all of that and their budgeting. And then the next one county requests received and court administrators. REC requirements, requests, recommendations, recommendations mm -hmm. for, for that we need. What's, that's, that's a good note. What's up there? Seems. Ah, uh, this weird. County is this panic mm -hmm. online. Was, was well, that would come from. Title four. County requests, that's coming from your <clears throat> count your side judges. Yeah. For their courts. Because sometimes we end up funding county courts. That's yeah. but that's separate from what their regular court administrator putting in their proposed capital budget requests. 
Yeah, why is that coming to us? Oh, because we uh, <laughs> it's all capital budget request. It's all capital budget request. So it's not divvied up the for county. We used to have county courts. And we would not pay, we shouldn't be paying for county court construction because we don't own the building. But there was little spots here and there where we did pay for county courts. Just to review the statute quickly, um, you know, it's any county requesting capital funds for its courthouse or court operation or court operation shall so sub submit a request to the court administrator. Administrator evaluates based on various cr criteria, and then the court administrator advises this committee um, every year on those requests. So we're trying to get a cohe cohesiveness to the process where prior to that it was coming in depending which party sat where and which legislator sat where and the condition of that county court. And we want to take the politics out of it. When you, when's the last time you got one of those requests? The courts have reconfigured yes. since then. Fine. So when the courts reconfigured into criminal court and civil court, before it used to be district. superior court and district court, family court. And your superior court dealt with most of your appeals and your municipal the district courts dealt not quite so much. They had criminal, but they had a lot more. And the courts reconfigured their operation. And they divided it up between civil and criminal. They never addressed the buildings. Well, I mean, in lieu of county executives, in the state, you have the assistant judges. Yeah. They are essentially the county right. executives. So your superior court buildings were run and owned by the county. So your superior court, your county courts, were not on the state nickel. That was on your county budget that's funded by your municipal budgets. Right. But the side judges were coming before the legislature wanting money for construction. And we unified some of the courts. We first, the first one we did was Addison County. We combined the state function and a county function. We did that. Then Lamoille County, when that came through, we consolidated because what was happening was a hodgepodge. Some were sharing space, but they, the county wasn't paying lease to the state, or the state wasn't paying for use of space in the county. The courthouse, the county courthouse may be using space in the state courthouse, and the state wasn't charging a lease payment, but they had some internal agreements that, oh, we'll take care of all the maintenance or we'll take care of all your printing needs. So we were trying to break through that to have some cohesiveness and some structure that was uniform across the state. And that's why if there's a county request for construction in a county court, it has to go through the court administrator. But so when they did the reconfiguration of the operation of the courts, they never resolved really who was the building of the superior court. But as Ben says, it's a state function, so by default, it's a state building. But that's never been clear. <clears throat> and we dealt with that way back in 2008, 2009, 2010, 2012. Was it resolved? No. Some courts have, still have both courts in the same building. In Newport, you see the two courts next to each other, mm -hmm. two courthouses. So in St. Johnsbury, they're both in the same building. Right. Yeah. Well, while they're in the same building, Burlington, they're in two different yep. buildings. By River, too. By River's two different buildings. It is two different buildings. Mm -hmm. Yeah, our superior, our superior, or the civil court, mm -hmm. is in Woodstock. Because that's our county seat. Mostly your your superior courts are in, in the, county seat, the yeah. town that's your county seat. Usually. We have New Fame. New Fame. Yeah, St. Johnsbury. <laughs> Hyde Park. So do we keep this? I, I just I don't know what to do. It's, it's your, if you're gonna continue to try to resolve the issue, you have to 
Would this be informative to keep having yeah. on the report? And extend, at least extend it. Like if it's, it may come up and we should, this would be useful if it came up. So to extend, extend. Extend. Yeah. Someday we'll resolve the issue. So the only one that we really need to ask further question about is the implementation, the notice of community placements. So if we want to extend that one or do away with it or retain it. Anything else? We finished the second page? Yep. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. We started we started with this. We started with this. Uh, with that yeah. Yeah. So, so far, we are getting rid of one, two, three, four, five, six of them. Well, Paperwork reduction act. We never, we never had any paper because they didn't do them. Right. They That's all. comforting. Okay. Reducing red tape. Well, I, have, I have seven because of the two DV reports that were on that list. The two what? The two DV shelter reports. Oh, yeah. So, I have repeal of... Trial services, repeal of pre-charge programs, repeal of the temp employees at DOC, repeal of the notice of any grants awarded to chairs, and then a repeal of the telecom authority report, repeal of both DV shelter reports. <coughs> so, yeah, oh, wait a minute. What have we got here? Three, four, five. I've got one, two. You're counting the domestic violence as one report, right? Well, I was counting as two, but yeah, so that's two. One, two, three, four, five, six. You came up with seven or six? Seven. Three, four, so four. let's go start on the first page. Two. Okay. I've got seven. You got seven. What did I miss here? First page, you've got <clears> the <throat> second one, the fourth one. And then the bottom one. That's what I got. Then on the second page, you've got the top one, the one next to it, skip, and then the next, and then the last one. Oh, I had that one. Okay, I put it in the wrong one. I put it in the retain. Okay. <laughs> it got me. <laughs> <laughs> I'll never live that one down. <laughs> she said that to number two. Yes, I know. <laughs> I had the wrong RE. <laughs> oh, <I'm sorry>. Right. <laughs> wrong. So, Chairman, do you want, once you get the question on the outstanding report, uh, tomorrow, whenever. Do you want to report to me, and then I can? I mean, this is supposed to go to the government operations committee, so I don't know if you want to just handle that. I can handle it with the GovOps, but the ones that go through judiciary committee, you might want to indicate to them what we are suggesting. Yeah, uh, and, and that's I plan to do that, but I just I can give this to GovOps. Okay. And it's, takes it off your plate. You don't have to worry about it. As long as I have the check marks in the right column. Don't worry, that's why you have Representative Morrison. Good luck. For extended, just to make sure we got it right, I got one, two, three, three, possibly four. Extend, yes. Extend. And then the remainders are all. And then the retain, I only have three. I only have two. I have three. Well, there's that one that's coming. No, you, how many do you have, Ben? Three. I have three. Uh oh. <laughs> Mary, we're getting Net zero. <laughs> Mary, you know. I have one on the first page. So do I. And then I have two on the back page. Which two? Um, the, the ten year. The third one down, and oh, the next to the last as, one. I have that as a. Maybe a short term extension. Oh, you have that yeah. one? But you might have said something else after. I'm probably wrong. Board activities and finances the pre preceding year for VHCB. Did we do that as an extension or a retain? I have it down as retain. Okay. I have it as retain. I'll just slide that you have right it as over. 
Mary, I stand, I stand corrected. I stand corrected. <laughs> Government oversight people. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we retained it. We're double checking the reports that we never received. But if anyone's interested, you can go through all of the things and see. Oh no, this was a fun experience just now. <laughs> <laughs> I think we should because I was so no. irritated to have to do all those reports and have them set on the shelf. No, I know. I know. I mean, we've got five pages here of reports to us that would be really worth it to go through. We should some really. Well, implementation of portable water and wastewater rules. Yep, that's a good one. Update on planning process for the Waterbury State. Complex. I think that one's old. That was Irene. Complete, isn't it? Yeah. Purchase of land from public field station sites. Yeah, we got Sustainable go Jobs that. Fund Corporation activities, which includes farm to plate program. Mental health facilities conditions. Um, some of these we do review. Well, those ones are. are you getting excited about it? Those ones aren't necessarily no. subject to this. Right, but this these are all point. reports that we get. Right. Some of those might already be permanent reports. Maybe that's why there isn't the they're listed on the review sheet. Orphan stormwater system implementation. We just got rid of that. What was that? Orphan stormwater. Oh, yeah. oh, we kept it. I don't remember. Impact of Act 179 of 2008 on corrections costs. <laughs> we really Community reintegration accuracy of sex offender registry. Improvements at domestic violence shelters funded by capital appropriations. Update on Waterbury reuse and Vermont State Hospital replacement projects. There's a lot we should. Evaluate goals and performances of pre-trial services, pre-charge right. programs. All right, you got me. Energy I'll, I'll efficiency. I'll look at it more. So it sounds like we got a lot more to say. I think we got stuff to go through on this. Anything that you see has to, has to be submitted by the Office of Legislative Council. We're not Council doing it unilaterally. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll probably find out we never got reports on those either. We're not doing it unilaterally. No, no, I'll, I'll, but I'm going to take the social security. You say, Ben, where's your report? It's repealed. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's an easy way to start off the week, folks. Right. Anything else? Thank you, Ben. So what Thanks, happens Richard. if one committee, like these, there's a couple there that, for us and judiciary, what if judiciary wants it and we don't? That's a good question. I don't, I don't know. Um, <laughs> Apple report. Would they end up getting it? We won? I mean, I can, to Connor? pure speculation on my part is that if <laughs> one committee says yay and the other says no, Maybe government operations kind of makes the final call since they're the one putting together the, the language on it. Yeah. But I, I don't know for sure. I can talk to Tucker. He's the one that sort of is the. Did we get first steps in deciding? I don't know. You're the, you're the first committee that I know that's actually scheduled time for this. So, so we'll just have yeah, to. We scheduled because of you. Oh. <laughs> you came in Friday afternoon. After so then we'll just gone. have to follow in our footsteps. That's all. First in time, first in right. There you right. go. Okay. <laughs> Anything else for Ben? Okay, thank you, Ben. Thanks, Ben. Thank you very My much. pleasure. I'll see you tomorrow morning. Yeah, you'll see us when we said. <laughs> You're going to have the statue for us, right? What a wonderful day to start yes. your day. Okay. <laughs> there are a few statues. A few statues, per se. Yeah. Yes. And rules. And rules, yeah. I oh, remember writing those things. The floods. Have a good night. See you, night. See you later. So, Doug, you're due at 2.30. Is anyone else coming in with you? Tristan, we want to report on those yeah. reports. Yeah. Can you hold on? Any reports? Just for a few minutes, I just want to give folks a little update. So on Friday with the Appropriations BAA, um, Eric and, and your name, Tristan, <laughs> <laughs> went in. Um, there's a couple things that pertain to our Committee of Jurisdiction. In corrections, the big piece is there's about $11 million for the side letter that was negotiated with BSCA about increased in salary shift differentials um, and benefits. And that side letter expires at the end of, it was March or is it June? I don't remember which one it is, if it's end of March or end of June. 
I don't remember which. But there's an $11 million request for that. And then the um, contract with Wellpath came in at $2.2 million over what, um, what they had anticipated when they put the budget together last May. Uh, last May. 2.2 more? 2.2 million. Does that go, does that go to 35.2 million? 35 million. Or it may go to 33. It depends what was budgeted in the May budget because they had not, we were still with the old contract. Wellpath didn't come on until July. So it was an anticipation in terms of what that contract would cost. So I don't know if it's 30, I think it's 33. So maybe they budgeted 31. That's the two. And then there's some things, something in there, and this is Trevor's looking at this, that's moving money. With JR2, there's some global commitment carry forward money of half a million dollars that they're putting that towards um, maybe putting that towards transitional beds, but there's some movement elsewhere in DOC's budget too. Trevor's going to track that one for us. So that's what's there for DOC. And we can weigh in with what we feel for that. Um, the other part that doesn't deal with DOC deals with the cash fund. Um, they're proposing that the portion of the cash fund that's paying for capital projects that we only do capital projects that are in the capital bill with the cash fund. And if you remember, we're going to be talking about some of this on Friday. If you remember, there are portions of other projects that d don't come through the capital bill that are part of that cash fund because it's all within the appropriations world because it's general fund dollars. There's a formula that's put aside that we have to go through. It's like 4% of the general fund increase. Only general fund, it's not the whole budget, it's only the general fund portion, would go towards capital projects. So what the administration is proposing that that is only put in the capital bill. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to go through appropriations. So that's what they're suggesting for FY24. What did we end up, was it three cash funds we ended up with? It's three. Uh, three or two. I think it we, came We didn't over. want any, right? <laughs> right. We ended up it with came three. over as three different ones, and then I think the two and three got consolidated. Yeah. And is one transportation focused? It's yeah. Yes. Yeah, we're okay. going to get that breakdown. Got this. <sighs> so that's that's part of BAA, that I'm aware of, the general fund BAA. And Doug is being very good about, because you were Deputy Secretary of the Administration <laughs> last year. <laughs> so that's what's before us. Come on. You want to send her a picture of today? <laughs> so that's what I know of. Did, did I miss anything, Tristan, on the probes? No, that's all we had. You need more information on this JR2 thing, whatever that is. Okay. So you might want to be in contact with Trevor. Yeah. Or some of that. Anything else on that one? Good, Nick. So, let's shift gears and we'll put. What's your title now, Doug? It's like chief you're the FEMA recovery person. FEMA chief. Chief, yeah, chief recovery officer, Madam Chair. Chief recovery officer. Okay. So we've we've kind of looked at this a little bit. I know we had you in in October, <clears throat> and I know that I've been asking 
for like a cheat sheet in terms of all these moving finance, finance piece for when we start figuring out what to do with the capital complex. Um, and before we get that, I think it'd be really, really important to talk about what what we're involved in right now with our capital complex, what we're seeing for insurance, what we're seeing for FEMA, and the layers that need to be applied. Does that make sense? Yes, absolutely. So, that, sure. so that's, you know, we're back to being preliminary, back to like October, but with a little bit more understanding. Okay. Um, so for the record, Douglas Farnham, Chief Recovery Officer for the State of Vermont. Um, <coughs> And one thing to throw out there for the committee is uh, elements of my role that have kind of stayed the same. I'm the recovery officer for both the pandemic and the flood. Uh, we are reaching almost a critical mass from the pandemic recovery, uh, which it seems like a decade ago, but it was actually last May that the federal disaster for the pandemic actually ended. So our, our economy, our municipal structures hadn't really fully recovered from the pandemic when the flood hit us. Um, so I think the ARPA state fiscal recovery, the bipartisan infrastructure law programs, Inflation Reduction Act, and the FEMA programs, part of my charge is to try to line all of those things up and make sure we're pursuing all the opportunities we can, we're kind of making sense uh, of those things as best as we can federal operating environment is massively confusing, so uh, we can only do so much. Um, we are still in the phases of working through the damage assessments with FEMA, but starting with insurance. We're closer to clarity. We're not at a final state yet with insurance, um, but we do have uh, 31 million dollars, just over 31 million dollars that we've received. That was like 31.6 million that we've received uh, in advance payments and in settled claims um, to this point. Uh, there was a spreadsheet that was under development that tracks those. It was very confusing. Like it managed to confuse even me, and I'm mm. this is what I do all the time. So I've asked for that spreadsheet to be reworked to be more understandable and. Um, to kind of make it so that as we receive more payments and as we update it, it will, we will understand the insurance. We've essentially received funds from our insurance company related to all of our NFIP, our National Floodplain Insurance Policy. We had buildings and contents. All of our buildings were 500,000. And then there was a business decision on each location about how much contents were in there and to how much we paid for contents coverage. In most cases, we got it right. In a couple cases, not as much right, like someone put something in a building that hadn't been there when the insurance was designed and it blew over the coverage limit. And that will go on our FEMA claim. So that half a million, that 500,000 is for each building? For each building, yes. Did that, uh, just to clarify, did that also cover the contents? 500,000 for contents, and I think our highest for contents may have been 250, but it might have been 100,000. 500,000 for building, 250 for contents? Um, at the most. I do have, uh, back at the office, I have the spreadsheet that breaks out. We had down to like 50,000 for contents in some cases, I believe, where it was scaled to what we thought the risk was with that particular structure's contents. And in some cases, they weren't keeping anything in there that would be damaged by water, so they didn't pay very much for contents insurance. Um, but it was variable, so every, every single structure had a different level of contents coverage, but the building coverage was always the same, the 500,000. And 500,000, and then the contents kind of varied. Okay. Yes. Um, so let me see. I can our, try to pull that up, actually. So our cleanup cost, our cleanup cost came in at 22 million, is what our cleanup cost came in at. Yes, our immediate cleaning and protective measures, yes. So is insurance picking up? that cost or is some of that also going to be FEMA? So that's um, our insurance coverage. Allocation of our insurance will be extremely important because category A and category B from a FEMA perspective, that's debris is category, category A and emergency protective measures are category B. That cleaning effort and that immediate
um, moisture remediation and mold remediation, making sure that the building didn't get any worse. That can qualify as category B, which President Biden signed an allowance for us for Vermont to claim 100% reimbursement for category A and B costs in a 30 day window. So we're going to get a fixed amount from insurance and we don't necessarily want to have insurance pay for things that FEMA would reimburse for at 100%. We'd rather have them pay for the, the best we can get from FEMA is a 90-10 cost share uh, for the rest of our building's work. So we do have to take our insurance payments and directly allocate them against all of our different line item costs. And unless FEMA forces our hand or the insurance company forces our hand, which I don't believe they would, we're going to try to allocate them against the cost of the buildings and the cost of the contents, not the cost of the emergency protective measures. Because theoretically, we should be able to get that entire amount back. Now, some of it drifted over that 30 day window potentially, but it'd still be at the, it then go down to a 90 10 cost split. Um, so we should be able to get most of that 22 million covered by FEMA. What was category B again? That is emergency protective measures. Um, it's a very boring example for buildings, but our swift water rescue team, you know, spending money protecting a property or lives, essentially. But remediation would be included in that, right? Yes. And it was also necessary because if we didn't remediate, then our insurance claims could have been denied because the state of the building, uh, might not have been at attributable to exactly what happened from the disaster itself. So what you're saying is for category A and category B, FEMA picks that up at 100%. If those two items, category A and category B, were all done within 30 days. Um, has to fall in that 30 day window, doesn't it? The governor gets to pick a 30 day window and we get when we get all of our invoices in, we'll pick advise a 30 day window. Yeah. I'll advise right. the governor on what's the most ideal 30 day window. The goal is to get reimbursed that 22 million. Yes, that would be the the biggest chunk of it. The activation of the state emergency operations center also falls under that category B, but that pales in comparison to the protective measures we had to do on 109 and 133. Does FEMA have a cap on what they will pay out for category A and category B? No, Madam Chair. Okay. So this is in hopes of that 22 million that we paid ServPro to clean up. The hope is that FEMA will pay 100% of that and not have to go into our insurance. That's my, that's my goal, Madam Chair, yes. Can I just ask what A was again, the specific? Uh, debris. Yeah, that's what so uh, the, the spending in debris was much smaller. I think this is probably wrong, but I'll throw it out anyway. It was in the range of somewhere around 5 million or so. I think it, historically, municipalities are responsible for the debris cleanup within their borders. This time around, we created a state contract that municipalities could sign on to, and we consolidated that into the state claim. It was much more efficient. Um, it took us a little bit to stand it up, so that was painful. But once we got it going, it was extremely effective. And it helped us find a vendor that had more scale and capacity than most municipalities can, can find on their own. And then Agency of Transportation did some debris cleanup. Um, but their bill was much lower, mostly only related to their staff time. As I thought, the coverage limits on contents are completely customized. And uh, they range from $78,000 up to $500,000. So they're <laughs> all over the place. Many, many, many numbers in between those two amounts. What do they mean by customized? So uh, in a particular building, so let's say, um, 126, hopefully I'm just trying to make sure I'm lining it up properly on my phone. 126 State Street, I believe, we only paid for 75,000 of contents coverage. That's your insurance? Yes, through insurance. Um, where, and I'm guessing based on what, we, what risk management saw as the exposure there, whereas the Berlin Central Garage, the main garage for AOT, 
uh, paid for 500,000 of contents coverage on that main building because it was a very large building with a lot of expensive equipment in it, a um, significant amount of which was destroyed. So what about there's a situation where you've got a building, like say you insured for 75,000 contents. And like you've said, in some of these buildings, there's more contents that came in after what you insured it for. So say the contents are now 100,000, but you're only insured to 75, who picks up that 25,000? It has a chance of going on, it can be put on the FEMA claim. But I know uh, with individual assistance, FEMA doesn't cover all types of contents. So I'm fairly certain they apply the same type of filtering to public assistance contents. It has to be um, necessary equipment. Um, mm -hmm. So there's a ch it will go on our FEMA claim and we'll kind of argue it out with FEMA. I think contents, you know, it could be touch and go whether they're willing to cover all of those contents or not. So could you give an example of what contents would be? Is it Laptops. Uh, sure. Laptops, furniture, um, the uh, the heavy automotive lift in the AOT central garage that was sh uh, the circuitry and that was destroyed. Um, so that was an extensive piece of equipment that wasn't part of the building. So let's look at 109, the 109, the pavilion. So the contents would be the auditorium. I'm assuming you get the chairs in there. You get the stage. <clears throat> Is that considered contents or is that considered more infrastructure of the building? That's a great question, Madam Chair. The, the affixed chairs, I would probably consider those part of the building itself. Mm -hmm. um, but projectors and things like that, like the water went up to and the ceiling. Move, so I think they can move. Yeah. The yes. Um, so your mechanical system is not considered contents. Correct. That's mechanical considered the building. The building. Yes. So in terms of the pavilion, because those seats are adhered to the floor, that would be considered under the five hundred thousand for the building. Yes, and all of our contents are being consolidated. All of our non-IT contents are being consolidated on the BGS FEMA claim, so that we have them all in one place. And then we'll look at what contents we have to take off of that with you from the insurance payments. And then IT related contents are going to go on the ADS claim. Um, but it may make sense for us to apply our insurance payment for contents to that, um, I, that ADS computer equipment. Uh, just so to simplify the process. We had some legislative items. Yeah. Contents in 133 and we had some IT contents they want that like a lot of lap, a lot of iPads went and all of that that were under yes legislature does that get considered as part of the contents in that building even though it's a different branch of government yes absolutely um, from FEMA's perspective you know the the state of Vermont is the state of Vermont they treat each agency as a sub claimant um, but we're doing the the building by building. Now, the insurance payments, they all go into the, the insurance special fund, and then the emergency board has the authority to transfer those payments out. So, for instance... Um, Can you explain, because I think yeah. some members, the emergency Sorry. board may be new. Yeah. New. So, the emergency board um, has some limited authorities to transfer general funds, to move some monies around, yes. Um, and in relation to uh, insurance payments, the, they have uh, authority without a limit. Normally they can only transfer up to, I think it's 2% or something like that of, of general funds. But with insurance, when the insurance special fund, there's a specific section uh, for their authority there where they can transfer those funds out to pay for repairs and to pay for replacement of contents, things that were destroyed. Um, the Secretary of Administration can do transfers, but only up to $10,000. So size of this event, that's not going to really do anything. So the people who sit on the emergency board are yeah. chairs of your appropriations committees, right. chairs of your Ways and Means and Finance Committee, and the governor. Right. That's your emergency board. So... Um, and of course, we had uh, we had like a twenty five thousand dollar deductible for building 
and and content side. So in the event we had less than twenty five thousand dollars of contents in a particular building, then that likely was just would just be included on our FEMA claim as uncovered losses. So things that were inside our deductible are able to be put on our FEMA claim. They will they only will not pay us for things that um, we received reimbursement for from insurance. So we're currently at thirty one million of what we've received related to our national floodplain insurance payments, our CNA policy and our Lloyds of London. We have these overarching statewide policies that will bring us up to um, a rough estimate for how much insurance we should collect is somewhere in the $50 million range, 50 up to mid fifties of insurance payments. It really comes down to the insurance companies agreeing um, on certain items and uh, in certain buildings, but. So right now you have 31.6 million. Yes. So you're saying there's almost another 19 million that might be coming in? Yes, we're expecting, we're expecting to break 50 million and then we have to um, negotiate through our brokers and everything with uh, on certain buildings and certain um, categories. But our aggregate policies, the $10 million and the $35 million, those were definitely exceeded by a, a very, very large margin. So I think it's partly uh, in the in the floodplain insurance, getting down to the details of how, how they valued the certain damage on some of the less damaged structures. The structures that had very, very significant damage, it wasn't really a question, right? We maxed out the policies, but um, there were a lot of smaller buildings damage that it adds up. So I want to be careful here because I just don't want to lock any any decisions in based on questions that are asked here. Right. Um, so we've got the cleanup costs, which is of the capital complex, mm -hmm. around twenty two million. So twenty four. Twenty four. So twenty four, twenty two. Last I heard was twenty four. It may be twenty four. I haven't. I think you just said twenty. Yeah, so it's 24. It was 22 in October. Yeah. It's gone up. So the hope is that FEMA will pick that up through category A and category B, depending on that 30 day window. So it would be it would be category B. Um, and it would it's already part of our claim to FEMA at this point. And the hope is that as much of it as possible be 100% reimbursement, yes. Um, so then we wouldn't be touching our insurance. And the money from the insurance could go. Right. It's what do we do with these buildings or renovations or future construction or even the construction that's occurred now? The only separation that I believe FEMA will be really strong about is the separation between building cost and insurance reimbursement and contents. So we'll make sure we get our contents um, separated out, but then we should have some latitude. Um, under Irene, FEMA allowed a portion of the, the blanket policy to just be allocated across all of the different building repair and costs to bring those back up to code. So. Under Irene, they were placed against the repair costs. They weren't placed against the um, emergency protective measures costs, which I don't believe we had served pro parallel uh, after Irene. Are you talking about the complex? Yes. Uh, no, it wasn't. It was really done internally. It really was done internally with the departments and within the agency, just right. hands on deck and just went through all the papers. And Put everything out onto the lawn and figure right. out what to do. And I talked with the recovery officer. One of the, well, I've spoken with both the recovery officers from Irene, but that did actually cause us significant headaches with our insurance company and with others because, you know, state employees were doing their best, but we weren't doing the proper like insurance company approved protective measures to like surf pro. Yes, surf pro. Plus, it was different. Irene didn't last for three or four days where the water just sat in the building. 
for three or four days. Right. John? On contents, um, just because you have a half a million dollars worth of insurance, you still have to prove what that you had on that, that amount of value. How was that handled? So most of the stuff's been disposed of. Yes. However, uh, that's actually one thing that Surpro was excellent for. As part of the cleaning process, when they were removing damaged contents, they photographed, they logged it. Okay. And so that helped protect the state's interests uh, pretty significantly. Okay. I mean, uh, so, and that's one reason it makes sense to have, and one uh, with contents, because it's always tricky, right? We had that process with BGS and ServPro validating what was damaged. And we're sending that damage inventory. We sent it out to every agency that occupied those structures to say, hey, is this right? Did we miss anything on this? We want to make sure we didn't overlook any of your damaged contents. So we at least generated a list for people to check. We didn't say, hey, tell us, tell us everything you lost. Um, but we have kind of a quality control check on okay. the content Good. side as well. Like, did the uh, state fleet program get damaged at all? You know, it looked like the cars would have been right in the floodplain there. They were. I was just wondering um, the other day if that was impacted. Yeah. The fleet employees were amazing, and I think um, perhaps even one of them may now work for the Joint Fiscal Office. Um, but they got down there when, when the weather reports really started to seem bad, and they moved all the vehicles out of the floodway. Excellent. So they prevented damage. significant amounts of damage. Uh, and. As we saw in Barry, cars in the river are not easy to get out of the river. So when we had Irene, particularly on the state level, we were really focused on the Waterbury complex. And that was in one spot, one building. I mean, they had a lot of little buildings there, but it was all interconnected. They were all interconnected either by a tunnel or something. They were all connected. Capital complex. Buildings are independent of each other in terms of functioning, mm -hmm. mechanical functioning, but also in terms of providing uh, services, providing governmental services. They're not connected. Where in the Waterbury complex, it was all agency of natural resources. It was agency of human services. I mean, that was the hub. Right. Is FEMA looking at the capital complex building by building by building, or are they seeing it as a complex, like they saw the Waterbury complex? Do you know? They are looking at it building by building, which for the, there is a small project threshold, um, which I should have this memorized, but I know it's at least a million dollars. Um, but projects that come in under a million dollars do not face their congressional review queue. So, they are much easier to carry out and they have, you know, you still have to make sure your expenses are all um, all proper because you might get audited, right? But there's less burden up front to carry out those projects. So um, under the advisement of our, our disaster response contractor guidehouse, who we've been working with on from pandemic recovery, we structured our project workbooks at the location level. It allows us also because our floodplain insurance policies were all at the location level, building by building. It allows us to line up the floodplain insurance payments with those specific structures. Um, however, we're, we're building the, the cost of insurance, right? And how much we're going to be paid for insurance. We're building our damage inventory, which um, for those state structures just in the Montpelier complex approaches $300 million worth of damage. And we are then going to present options to the legislature, similar to what we did after Irene, where some of them would be repair and, and mitigate in place. Some of them would um, involve different layouts, right? Because all of those little independent buildings, some of them are massively historic in value, and the entire building is historic, like the Secretary of State's gorgeous building. like. That'd be very difficult to do anything with, right? Because it's gorgeous. Uh, but the Green Mountain Care Board structure that is, um, you know, decimated cubes. It was decimated and it's not historic and it's not in a great location, right? Um, so that's where the uh, we develop the list of damage that FEMA is willing to pay for. Uh, 
And then we proposed to FEMA um, alternate projects, which means we're not rebuilding it exactly in inside its its footprint. We're we're trying to do something different, something creative um, that uh, FEMA can approve that type. And that's uh, the alternate project. Irene, the Waterbury complex was the first alternate project that FEMA did in in the country. So Vermont likes to be first. We were we created a whole new category of project for FEMA. Um, because other states just weren't thinking that way. So I want to go back to the floodplain insurance. Is that part of that five hundred thousand per building, and part of the twenty five thousand deductible per building? Yes. Yeah, so it's part of that whole insurance is not on top of. Right. So. Um, the way our kind of waterfall of insurance works, the first tier to hit is the floodplain insurance. So we have $25,000 deductible. The next $500,000 on of building damage would be covered by our floodplain insurance. Anything above that starts to go onto our aggregate policy. See, that's what we need in a cheat sheet. That's exactly what we need, how that lays out. Your first part is your floodplain insurance. And that goes up to half a million per building. And then after that, it kicks something else kicks in. Yes, Madam Chair. I'm, how does FEMA kick into that? I'm trying to work on how to draw all the arrows and, and make it a visual because the deductible from the very beginning goes down and goes into the FEMA claim. So there'll be kind of a bucket of what ends up in the FEMA claim. Mm -hmm. And you can try to show how things pass through different layers and eventually end up in the FEMA claim. Some of them go straight there. Some of them have to go through. Go through some steps. Yes. Then whatever you're left with at the end, might you might pay that as a state, or it might go into the FEMA bucket. Yes. Something, because there's going to be state dollars going in here. Yes. There, I don't remember if it happened with Irene, but it wouldn't surprise me if there were some costs, some damages that insurance didn't, didn't cover and FEMA isn't willing to pay for, right? That we haven't really identified yet. Nothing significant like that has jumped out to me yet, but we're, the total disaster right now has over $620 million of damage assessed to it. Is that the capital? That is complex? statewide, sorry, statewide. Um, the capital complex number continues to fluctuate, but it's somewhere around $300 million. And part of that fluctuation is determining exactly how the, the flood hazard area rule plays into with historic preservation. And that influences what FEMA is willing to pay for on a building. And we're trying our best to make sure it doesn't undercut the amount of repairs and mitigation we're going to be able to do. And that flood area rule is that two feet above the base flood level? Yes. Every, every structure that was impacted was was inside the flood hazard area. Um, 111, I believe, it just barely brushed up against the front of the building, but that counts, so. Uh, Doug, as we wait for the like reimbursements, right, it takes a long, long time to come in. How does that sync up with the budgeting process, right? Like, can we bank that money because we know a certain amount's going to come, like it's in the mail, or do we have to operate sort of as a deficit, you know, and, and reconcile in the budget adjustment next year? Yes. Um, so the way we've been approaching it for emergency spending, that when we look at it, like the CERPRO, for example, um, finance and management authorized excess receipts requests anticipating FEMA reimbursement for that. So they spent in anticipation of that, of, of those federal receipts. So in that particular area, we're running a cash deficit. Now, luckily, um, Vermont has an extremely high cash balance right now. So it's not as much of a problem as it would have been in say 2010 when our cash balance i think was somewhere between 300 and 500 million maybe even more towards the 300 million dollar side so right now um in it, uh, spending in anticipation of those receipts isn't dangerous financially uh, because of our healthy healthy cash balance um, as we spend down the arpa funds that cash balance is going to get more towards the historical average and then it becomes a real question of 
you know, um, should we be spending in anticipation now for, for the, the vast majority. So for $270 million of the capital complex cost, we haven't begun any of that special uh, spending because we would, um, we're anticipating a process like after Irene where um, the legislature approves the path and then the, the spending authority related to that is, um, is granted. Uh, I do think, um, Sorry, I'm trying to remember exactly what vehicles, what things are in. We'll need, you know, we'll need match. And, and the general practice is you don't grant this federal, federal spending authority until you at least court, uh, identify where your match is going to be coming from. And then you spend the federal receipts uh, in anticipation of reimbursement. Um, we're hoping to cross 100 million obligated for the disaster in the next couple of months. Once we cross 112 million, 112.4, I believe. That's when we can go officially to that 90-10 cost share with FEMA. We're still technically at a 75-25, even though with 600 million of damage reported, um, none of us believe we'll stay at that. When I say us, I mean within the administration, sorry. Dr. Lee, helpful, Doug, thanks. So the goal is to get to the 90-10. <clears throat> with the 90-10, yes. if we got there, for our capital complex, would the 9010 be applicable to all of our buildings there when we do the work? Or is some of it going to be 75, 25? It's a great question, Madam Chair. So, so that the Waterbury complex, there were some that was 9010, there was some that 75, 25, wasn't the same match to the whole system. So, does, is it limited to the money once you go over the, the threshold for 9010, or is it? You want to get 90 10 on that month, that amount that's above the threshold back to dollar one yes um so it would be for the whole disaster the state of vermont state municipalities would be looking at approximately 60 million dollars of match that would have to be for those 600 million for 600 million of uh approved damage um so yes in irene that's at 90 10. Uh, yes, at 9010, yes. That's statewide? Uh, statewide, yes. And that's um, that's only talking about FEMA again. Um, there's FHWA and there's other other things happening that I'm going to avoid getting into for the moment. Um, you're right, Madam Chair. After Irene, FEMA only agreed to pay for a certain amount of of repair and mitigation on the Waterbury complex. And that was because our codes and standards were not um, as firm and clear as they are now. After Irene, a and r significantly clarified codes and standards and our, far, and our flood hazard area rule, our FARC rule, as everyone um, that's way too close to it calls it. Um, so we had to take hazard mitigation money that's a 75-25 match, regardless of the size of the disaster, and use that towards Irene. So the goal here would be to keep as much of the project or all of the project in that 90-10 range. If we have to go above, if, if to achieve what the legislature feels is the right path, if we have to go above that approved FEMA PA amount, then yes, we would start breaking into the 75-25 range. So there's a couple things there. With the size of this disaster, roughly $600 million, after we reconcile insurance and everything, it's going to be somewhere in that ballpark, but it could go down to 570. It could stay around 600. Um, with the size of this disaster, we get 15% of that amount towards hazard mitigation, proactive hazard mitigation activities. That money generally stays at a 75-25 split. So we'll get around 80 million. We'd have to come up with around 20 million to utilize that 80 million dollars. So that potentially could be used to, it was in Irene, to use to augment the project. There is a potential for that match to be changed from 75 to 85. That's being the criteria for that. FEMA has not done that with anyone yet. The criteria are being discussed at FEMA headquarters. And we're in discussions with uh, we're in discussions with them about um, you know what criteria they might publish because for some of their programs there are ways we could try to get more funding from FEMA, 
but the cure is worse than the disease um, because we would have to spend millions of dollars at a statewide level every year to get a more favorable rate from them in some cases, and it's just not worth it. So we have some questions. Yeah, sorry. I'm sure. I'm good, actually. Sorry. Can you just clarify, with the size of this disaster, it's 600 million, there's possibility we'll get 15% for what? So, so okay. for hazard mitigation, so proactive, it's usually not used on buildings that were damaged. It's used to address issues that are risks still, uh, floodplain mitigation. In Irene, it was necessary to use that money for buyouts. In this disaster, there's another $40 million pot that can be used for buyouts specifically. It's called the Swift Water Program, and that's a 25% match as well. Mostly a match, though, because FEMA only pays 75% of fair market value for buyouts, and that is not achievable for people. You can't, you know, most people can't accept 75% of their home's value and then just go buy a new house. Um, so we have programs to help bring it up to 100% of fair market. Sorry for the deviation, but that's um, how all the financial pieces are fitting together with this one. Okay. Um, so, so we, is that money, where do you get the pot of money to bring up the, the max that fair market value? So um, there generally it's been a one-time general fund appropriation to, to, to come up with that. In some cases, the municipality involved um, comes up with a portion of the match. Um, it's not really structured. Uh, we, we deal with it as best as we can and have over the last 10 years. Um, one of my long-term goals is to propose more structured ways that people can approach buyouts and hazard mitigation work. Like right now, municipalities know if they repair something after it's damaged in a federally declared storm, the state will cover between 30 and 70% of their local share based on what hazard mitigation elements they have in play. They have no guarantee that if they try to do a, a proactive floodplain mitigation project that the state will have any financial involvement in that. Um, so it's, we pay people to help with repairs, but we don't pay them to help them with preventing damage in the first place. So this session, I plan to talk with the policy committees about that quite a bit. And one of the municipalities' approach to mitigation actually is upstream, right, in another municipality. How does that work? So that can play into the cost. So any mitigation work from FEMA, like Irene required a cost-benefit analysis, and, and um, we would have to run the cost-benefit analysis, and we would look at the downstream and upstream impacts of any project like that. And um, one of the nice things with FEMA is that they are incorporating social benefits into some of their cost benefit analysis. They are slowly modernizing the, the way they do their cost benefit analysis. Um, and that's one reason I do this spring plan to help organize more regional watershed discussions uh, because we need to generate whether or not we can um, fully fund $100 million of, pro of mitigation projects in the state. We need to generate $100 million, a list of $100 million of projects. And that has to come from the communities. And if the capital complex, if the negotiations with FEMA don't achieve all of the funding through the regular FEMA public assistance program that we need, then the capital complex could be partly hazard mitigation funded, partly regular FEMA funded and eat into that. But ideally, we would have the complex project fully funded at the 90-10 split and then identify these floodplain projects that reduce the risk to our downtowns in the 75-25. Wayne? Back in the 2010s, we had floods back then too. And FEMA came in with some of those projects did things to many, especially for some of the bridges or like that. Um, and then look at the success because we've had floods back since then. The success of those navigation details, you know, what they did, the mitigation work, you know, how much did they, they think they saved by doing what they did? 
So all of the infrastructure, um, the, the infrastructure that was made resilient or rebuilt after Irene was a particularly large category that we looked at. It all held up extremely well. Like the water break complex got, I think, $200 worth of damage to clean up the parking lot or something like that, right? It, it basically was surrounded by water, but it was undamaged. And many of the bridges, the culverts, um, there was an example where Cabot had a significantly upsized culvert. It's an amazingly large culvert for the size of the stream. However, a massive amount of debris came down the mountain and still caused the culvert to fail. Or the culvert, but um, you know, when a tree is coming down the hill, there's not, not much a, a culvert can do about it. So um, yes, AOT has implemented a new resiliency tool um, and they're getting, and they've been working on it over the last decade, right? But repeat, repetitive damage is one thing they look at. Um, and their, their standards on culverts now are, you know, massively ahead of where they were 10 years ago. So uh, I think a lot of, I think it is a slow process of, of changing over our buildings and making them resilient. Um, the amount of property we own in the state and the, it is going to take us decades to make our structures resilient. Um, but we do have to focus on the ones that were damaged, like 109 and 133 first. Mm -hmm. And figure out what we're doing with the other five buildings that were damaged. Yes. First floor. Because they're not habitable right now. Correct. So, no, you go down to the bridge down here and look upstream and see that real bridge. Mm -hmm. See the constriction right there is going to raise the water surface elevation of the stream. So, really, as part of the mitigation, things like that be looked at and be a tool for being correct. Uh, yes, absolutely. I know that, um, yes, the the bridge abutment or the, the highway footings that are right across from the cemetery, that early hydrological data showed that that created a backflow into, into Montpelier, right? That it made the flood conditions in Montpelier worse. So I think looking at that is going to be uh, something. I know that after Irene, the, I mean, there's been stories about it recently, the, the farm in Duxbury that, you know, if a mitigation project <laughs> there it could it could reduce water breeze risk pretty significantly. I think that's for most of our projects right now, anything that we could have done on state land, we've likely already done. We might've missed some things, but most mitigation projects for floodplain are gonna have to happen on private land. And that's always, you know, it requires a significant community conversation and then trying to get those landowners on board. And, you know, someone from the state coming in and saying, hey, we'd like your land to do a floodplain project. That's a sure way to kill it. So. <laughs> we could try housing a juvenile center there or a juvenile facility there. That would kill it too. <laughs> Give them a choice. <laughs> yeah, right. Right. And then we flood it out completely. <laughs> what about our dams? Has, I mean, part of the problems or concerns has been the age of some of our dams and if those ever gave and maybe even thinking, do we build some dams? That's a long-term process. But what about that piece in the future? So um, for the, <clears throat> there was a house transportation and environmental joint hearing um, the, the manager or director, I, I didn't catch his exact title, of the dam safety program gave a presentation there. Like green is the I think it's Ben Green. Ben green. And he gave a, a good presentation on the state of our dams, what they did after the disaster. Uh, generally speaking, I think that um, we have a hard enough time keeping up with our current infrastructure. So I think building more dams. Um, would be a challenge when we're really trying to our best to keep up with our current uh, load of dams. I do know Secretary Moore is um, pushing more nature-based solutions right now. Um, and I mean, by nature-based, I mean, you know, like the floodplain style projects, right? Um, which require, you know, less or zero maintenance once they're done, but each one of those achieves less mitigation or less impact than a hard, than a hard infrastructure project. So it's more of a, 
attempting to achieve the whole by chipping away at it through. Um, and I do think like we, we tend to talk about the Dog River Park in, in Northfield Falls as a really good example of a mitigation effort that created something that's valuable to the community, uh, lowers the risk in that neighborhood. And, um, but that was, I think, I think it was eight houses, something like that. And it was a huge effort to get that project done. So I think the areas where we're restoring our floodplain, we need to focus on that and do that wherever we can, but they're, they're going to be hard to achieve, which is one reason I tell individuals and business owners right now, and they don't like me for this. When they say, you know, what should I do? You know, do I rebuild? I said, you know, make your decision, assuming there will not be any significant floodplain mitigation. Make your decisions, assuming the rivers are what they are right now. We're going to spend this year trying to do as many projects, line up as many projects as we can and reduce your risk. But we can't promise that that will happen because they're almost all on private land. So mitigate in place or, you know, make your make your decision on where to set your business up elsewhere. It's kind of a little bit cold of a message, but I think it's important to be realistic. And would that be true for both Montpelier and Barry? Or are there more mitigations that might help Barry more than Montpelier or vice versa? So the the proposal that the governor made for the north end, the gateway neighborhood in the north end of Barry, that's an example of looking at that neighborhood, assuming the current levels of the river, this is how we would recommend it, it be rebuilt. Yeah, how did the community, is the community still processing? There's a, I mean, that was yes. not back when, November? Yes, there's a community meeting scheduled next Wednesday. We've been working with the city and with Barry Up and others. And, you know, there are, of course, some people who don't like the plan. There are some people who like the plan. And one thing we've been very clear about is that was a starting plan. Mm -hmm. However, the community wants to adjust it. Um, as long as it, it creates a resilient vision where we're not, you know, if the water levels rise to the same extent, we're not having people that same level of human suffering and property destruction. That's what we want for the North End. Um, there are some opportunities um, in the river corridor. Um, and that's where A&R getting the river corridor data and really telling people where the opportunities are, like highlighting the bridge abutment and highlighting the farm in Duxbury and seeing um, and trying to find as many opportunities as possible, finding some landowners that are at least willing to talk about it and, um, and going from there. I do think we don't have one reason um, these, structure, these conversations don't happen more rapidly is that we have you know, the local governments and then we have the state. The regional planning commissions aren't... We don't have the county government. We don't have that middle piece. We don't have the middle piece that usually organizes this type of regional watershed discussion where, where you're having upstream and downstream impacts, where it's, you know, you're doing something in a community that's not for your community, it's for community to two uh, towns down. I didn't understand why the regional planning commissions aren't doing that. They're helping with those discussions, um, but reactive. They're doing they're doing a great job in supporting people and supporting project development. Um, but I would say. They. They don't necessarily have the like a statutory responsibility to do that, and their funding is always tied to specific projects and specific activities. So that's probably the biggest reason is that they don't have as much general purpose funding. They have do this for this program. And with federal funds, we have to do it that way because federal programs always say, okay, we'll give you this much for admin, but you can't even talk about anything else. You just have to work on our program. And so um, a lot of the RPC structure is based on, individual, on on lining up all these different grants and different opportunities. So they're, they're not government. They are, but they aren't. Well, they're not uh, like, are they considered a municipality? They're not really taking, they don't really. No. Because solid waste districts. They're not a municipality. The solid waste districts are considered a municipality under state statute. Would planning commissions be at all? They don't get paid by the state, do they? The state doesn't. They're doing solid waste districts. 
I thought they were independent organizations that were serving a function for I am, this is where I say I'm not an attorney, right? But my understanding is that they are not municipalities, that they are, uh, we have a number of, so we have some component units of the state that are part of the state, part of the state, but not part of the state, like um, Vermont Housing Conservation Board is a component unit of the state. They are separate from the executive branch, so they're not part of the state of Vermont executive branch, but they're financially intertwined with us on our on our financial reporting. So they're a component unit. The regional planning commissions are not component units of the state. There are entities which have been created in statute, but they're not municipalities and they're not component units. I don't know if they would be classified as instrumentalities, but um, I'm going to look up the de definition statute of municipalities. Yeah, it said it encompasses a lot yeah. more than you think when you really start looking at it. Anyway, go for it. We'll have an example. I think an example of this where there was a flood resilient communities fund. Yes. So money was out there. The legislature put money towards that. On the select board in Halifax, I said, huh, this looks like something we could use. The RPC said, well, okay, we have this report that's been sitting on the shelf of your you know, Green River Corridor mm -hmm. um, and identified possible mitigation projects. So um, ultimately, we didn't do anything basically because of, you know, the RPC is not sort of providing leadership. There's not, you know, there's reports sitting on a shelf and a fund over here and making, connecting the dots is hard. Yeah, it's not a mechanism for that. Right. Can't even find the definition, so that's a mode issue. Right. <laughs> Just curious. Okay. Mm -hmm. Go for it. So, is there any discussion? So, in, in my communities that got hit pretty hard in the flood, um, Route 15 um, east to west, uh, for instance, in Hardwick, um, runs right along the river. Right. Got huge amount of damage, weeks and weeks, and I'm sure hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars of damage. And so I was speaking with someone at one point and they said, well, that boy, that, I mean, of course, the road's been there for 100 years, but I said, well, that road never should have been built there because it's in a floodplain. So, and we find a lot of roads in Vermont um, are in that category. Um, is there ever any discussion about trying to move some of these roads or change? Um, it built the road up with a lot of stone um, on the riverside, well, and I think that probably, but this ledge on the other side, there's no way. So, yes, there's definitely shifting of roads definitely has been discussed in multiple instances. Yeah. I think what it comes down to is in order to get FEMA to pay for moving a road, mm -hmm. you have to do the cost benefit analysis with repetitive damage to show that in order to mitigate it so that it doesn't get damaged anymore, it would be so expensive that it's going to be equally expensive or less expensive to shift it out of the floodway. Uh -huh. um, and so it's it's a very challenging process to convince them of that, right? Um, the other thing we run into is, you know, it's Vermont, so you've got a you've got a river, you've got a road next to it, and then you have a forty five degree hill. Yeah. Uh, so <laughs> all the, all, everywhere. Yeah. So that I mean. I do know it's something AOT considers, and um, and I think more often than not, the practicalities of shifting a road just overwhelm us. Yeah, I was well, just curious. That's almost the same as can you move a downtown out of the downtown? Can you yeah. not yeah. kill your downtown out of the downtown? Yeah. Can you move Barry downtown out of the downtown? Yeah. You know. I mean, in Springfield, if we didn't have that flood control dam, we would have been wiped out in Irene. Because we're a downtown right near the river. A lot of our town, Brattleboro, is a downtown right near the river. So we're going to move our downtowns. Over there. I do think in the in the overall event, and this was um, one way great, right? Because it prevented a lot of damage, but also it also reduced the damage to where it didn't hit the federal thresholds of the event. But in Addison County, a lot of the post Irene um, floodplain restoration work was very successful, stored massive amounts of water that then did not, you know, destroy Middlebury and other downtowns. 
Now there was damage in, in certain pockets, um, but the, the, the projects there to store a lot more water were very successful. And Brattleboro actually had more than one example of a floodplain restoration project that, that functioned very well. So both from the hard infrastructure and the nature based infrastructure, um, the things we've done over the last 10 years perform well. I, I don't even know how much damage there would have been if we hadn't had Irene and then we had this exact event. It would have been worse. Yeah. It would have been worse. It would have been, I think, more than just additive. I think it would have been well over a billion dollars worth of damage. John? Has a timeline been developed for um, the, the, the mitigation plans? And I'll use the 133 as an example. There's a lot of band-aids over there to get the building operational. But last I heard, the plan hadn't even been developed so equipment could be ordered. Is there, any, is there a timeline when that might progress? Because we have to get FEMA to agree to exactly what they're willing to pay for, um, that's going to take us, it, if we had their complete agreement before the session ended, I would be ecstatic. But can you explain, uh, <laughs> back up a little bit, Sorry, yes. we went ahead and did some of this work. What, that may put us in jeopardy for FEMA reimbursement or not? Um, depends on not, the work. Depends on the work, not necessarily. Um, we have a pretty good idea of the things that would be safer to do with them. Um, but I think the two big examples, the two biggest price tags, right, are what do we do about the mechanicals in 109 and 133? Do those go on the first floor? Do they go in a separate structure and use the utility tunnels? Like how we address the mechanicals. We know that FEMA is likely to pay for that elevation um, and, and re relocation of those mechanicals. Um, but I think, so we know that's a safe, a relatively safe expense, but we need to develop the plans so that, um, so that the legislature can approve the right path, right? Uh, do we lose a floor of 133 to mechanicals? Um, or do we try to build another small structure over here? Or do we, you know, um, there are at least four or five hypotheticals that have been thrown about, but all of them kind of build off of what is the total FEMA approved scope of damage that we're addressing. And then we, we, we go from there. And I think the, um, the fact that we have some historic buildings thrown into the mix, mm -hmm. uh, buildings that aren't entirely historic, but have certain historic elements, like I think the facade of 133, I think is the historic element on that building um, that just has slowed down the conversation with FEMA and scoping out exactly what the plans will be. I think so one thing we've done here to help with this process is um, Guidehouse is helping us with the general FEMA process, but we're also, we brought on a hazard mitigation specialist that worked for the, the state of Massachusetts for many years that actually worked in Vermont during Irene and has experience directly related to the water rate complex rebuild. And so he's helping us plan and present our case in the best possible light to FEMA. And um, part of that is, you know, not wanting to endanger our case and make sure we make sure we are as clear as possible with FEMA, because once you put something on the record in, in with incorrect phrasing with them, that sometimes is, uh, that's that. <laughs> and if you choose not to do a project for whatever reason, if, and then there's another event, FEMA just says, tough luck, we told you so. Yes. Um, I think the situation is still evolving, but we had an appeal related to the Highgate landfill. No, maybe not landfill. Sorry. It's in Highgate. Slide. Slide. There was a landslide there, yes. And there was a mitigation study that was done and it identified some risks in the area. And FEMA tried to say, well, you studied it and you didn't do anything, so we're denying that cost. However, the, the land that failed and, and the landslide that was created was not in an area that was identified as a risk during that study. So we're hopeful that we can win that appeal at this point since we said 
look at, it's not on the list of high priority areas. So it's not by us, you know, geology is not, you know, we do our best. There's two, two of them there, one, one near the landfill. Yeah. There's one, another uh, one runs a trailer. Yeah. We had um, a historic amount of landslides, unfortunately, along with the well over 60, I believe it was. Oh, sand over the landslide. So we're going to have to make some decisions during the session on some of these buildings. I'm looking at the Capitol complex. This is our jurisdiction here in this committee's Capitol complex. We're going to have to make some decisions somewhere along the line. And hopefully, like you said, you may not have any information from FEMA until May or June, April, May. Joe, Later. we're going to have to make some decisions in terms of like 133, possibly the pavilion, mm -hmm. possibly some of these other buildings moving the mechanics up. Um, then we've got to deal with the historic buildings piece. Some of them are historic and some we may have to raise. Right. It's just not going to be salvageable. I think. Even even the parking lot is something to discuss. We have parking lot. a parking lot right over there next to the river. Mm -hmm. We had temporary bank stabilization that was performed because the edge of the parking lot is failing. So we did temporary bank stabilization as an emergency protective measure to stop the more parking lot from falling into the river. Um, but depending on what you do with the different structures, I think it is a question of, you know, do we do we maintain a parking lot that goes right up to the river's edge? Or do that as a floodplain? And it was, it was filled, filled into the floodplain when it was built. Yeah, yeah, interesting. So when I was down here right after the flood meeting with BPS, <laughs> and we were walking through the tax department parking lot, that rear parking lot that doesn't really get a whole lot of use, looked at it, I thought, why don't we build a building here and store everything in it? Because it seems to me that creating space to move all your communications gear and electronics to a first floor in some of these buildings is a use of space that maybe we can't afford. Yeah, that upper parking lot behind the tax department, yeah. I think one of the potential designs will likely contemplate what if we put a mechanical structure? Yeah. That's what's behind yeah, here. Right there, yeah, yeah, because it's an L-shaped building and you can yeah. tuck it there. You can't even see it from the street. Right. No, um, the marks there. I mean, it's not very well used. Yeah. So with the what are the chances though? Is that in a five hundred year flood plane? I mean that. If you, you, build, up, if you, you build, build it, you it you up. Build it yeah. so that you have your all your equipment all off the uh, above the flood plane. So. Right. See, that's, I'd like for the committee at some point on a nice, nice day, <laughs> cold winter day, but a nice day to just take a tour of the complex if we could, um, just to kind of get a perspective. So if we did a mechanical building there, would it just be for 133 or would it be for other buildings in I the complex? Could, I, I would think so. The whole complex. I mean, that's where a lot of the potential designs and questions come in, right? The, the tunnel which currently is a pedestrian tunnel between 133 and 109, that completely flooded. Mm -hmm. um, so I think there's a legitimate question of there of, do you maintain that type of tunnel? Uh, well, it did take water in, which prevented <laughs> <laughs> right? the building. Right? Yeah. I mean, it did take in the water. Um, well, then we could build a, expand into a vault, you're saying? It's our mo. It's our mo around the building. I'm just saying that <laughs> it took up the extra water. If that tunnel wasn't there, there would have been higher water in some of these buildings, I would assume. Mm, I don't think the volume not, is not that much water. Right. Yeah. So the... The, the water level kind of overflowed that to the point where, I mean, uh, but you could achieve a similar effect where if it was just a utilities tunnel um, and, you know, you kind of mitigated it to the point where it was just meant to pass utilities and those utilities wouldn't be damaged in the event any water got in there anyway, I was thinking, yeah. Yeah. Then, then it'd be a different, then it'd be a different animal. And it naturally drained out. So what FEMA refers to as wet proofing, right? Like 
sometimes your first floor of your structure or your basement is never going to be outside of risk. So you wet proof it so that if water gets in there, it has ways to escape. It doesn't cause damage. The materials aren't um, subject to mildew and mold and things like that. So this is what I'm thinking is going to be before us as a committee to start making these decisions mm -hmm. and start taking those first steps so that the work can continue over this calendar year. And Madam Chair, I can connect with Guidehouse and BGS to see how much we can move up at least our timeline as far as presenting information, what we can, what we can, what we can lay out now, what we can safely talk through now before, you know, as much as we can without jeopardizing, jeopardizing the FEMA process. I'll admit we tend to be a little conservative on things involving FEMA because we well, I'd rather be conservative yeah. yes, than trying to... You don't want to blow it. Penalize I don't want to be the one that loses Vermont $30 million. Or you don't. Not a good thing. Exactly. Not a good thing. What, is, what would be things that would drive us forward on, on certain buildings moving forward? Um, you know, they're all kind of on temporary, these temporary permits, sort of operationally... Where are you scream, hearing the most screams from tenants that, that we need to move on uh, fixing the building? You're talking about capital complex? Yeah. Um, BGS has been dealing with the relocation effort, um, I think, extremely well. There's been a couple of offices that still are struggling to find the right space and the right location. Um, but one happy side effect of the degree of telework that came out of the pandemic is that it was much easier for them to find temporary space um, than it would have been if everyone was working in the office every day. Um, so I do think most places are keeping the keeping operations running, keeping the lights on, have a decent place to collect and have their collaborative time. But there are one or two business units that are still not in an ideal state. Uh, and BGS is trying to find them a uh, better space. They've kind of used up most of their available space for that. So that could drive price and some of priority for construction, potentially. Certainly. I think especially um, like the alternate project approach where if we, we being the state of Vermont chose not to, chose to uh, not repair two or three structures, right? Then the, the funds that FEMA otherwise would have paid could be used towards either rebuilding that structure somewhere outside the floodplain or augmenting a different building. Um, I think the, the, the sad truth with us right now, and maybe this is a little bit too far out of line, but like our structures inside the floodplain aren't the only ones with challenges. I went to look at 1416 Baldwin the other day and there's no parking there. It's a strange building. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Um, yeah. yeah. So if we look at rebuilding, we've got to really take into consideration how many of the employees are physically going to come back to the building. Is 10% of our employees going to continue working remotely? 20% of them, what does that do to our construction costs? How much does that save? How much, you know, how, how that's going to have to be incorporated. And, and what's difficult about it is that could change in 10 years where people say, I don't want to work remotely anymore. I want to come back into an office. So, And also the, the impact on Montpelier's downtown businesses, which are already struggling quite a bit. Um, and I know that was a, a strong consideration after, after Irene and Waterbury was, you know, how many state employees are going to be staying in the exactly. downtown area. And we built it for it. Teleworkers, we called it teleworkers back then. We built it for maybe 10 or 20, 10% maybe to be working at home. And now when you go over there, they're all working at home. I wonder if we could find a post office to put someplace. Like your style. 
<laughs> what other questions does the committee feel or, or want more direction on from Doug that we need to have answered? People think about. It's going to be unfolding in terms of the insurance and FEMA and all of that. When do you think we hear back, start, you know, start to hear from, from you and DGS about planning scenarios for uh, next steps with construction? In the budget address? Um, Hopefully. No, uh, sorry, Madam Chair. Um, I think the, I'll have to connect with, with BGS on what our timelines would be there, but I think one deliverable I can take away from this is um, you need at least a starting timeline of deliverables related to this project so that we can start to talk about what's realistic, when we can deliver what, um, and I know that um, there was a structure set up after Irene for, um, you know, continuation and approval of levels of the project after the session concluded. But I think like that, approval. right, legislative approval, right. Uh, so I think that type of mechanism will be un, will be very important for this project. Um, but. Uh, I'll circle up with them and then let you know how quickly I can get you that timeline. Great. Other questions or thoughts or answers? You want more answers to? Yeah. We need answers. We'll kind of open the timeline. It's really project is possibly going to look how it's going to look. Has today been helpful for folks? Very helpful. Yeah. RPC, is there any political subdivision of the state? There are political sub. Do you found that? Yeah. yeah. Well, there's going to be a lot of work done on some of our other committees on, on resiliency, mitigation, a whole peace and I hope that we are part of those conversations too because I'm sure some of it's going to involve state lands possibly yes. state buildings possibly um, and we'll be doing our own I think one piece that's really going to be we're going to have to make some decisions on whether to keep some, some of those buildings or demolish them that's going to be a difficult conversation. I would think we'd be able to do that this session, wouldn't we? Or is that going to harm anything with FEMA and may harm with FEMA? I think there's a good chance we could at least lock in intentions. So Maybe make final decisions. Yeah. Um, I think there's a really good chance, Madam Chair, that we could get that far down the road by the end of the session, yes. Do you think we'd be at a point that there might be three options going forward? And we're just not sure which option to take that we need. We'd have more information like in the fall that we'd be able to make a decision between those three options or melding together of some of them. Yes. Yeah. Just thinking how to structure it. It's like what we did for the Waterbury complex, same thing. Right. Is there any concern that these electrical systems and, and things that were flooded that were on temporary permit for will start to flicker out and we'll just have to start throwing, dumping money into it one way or another? Careful. <laughs> <laughs> we don't know. What's I think there is a concern that. Um, and we are kind of watching those systems very closely because there's a concern not only that they'd start failing, um, SERPRO did an excellent job cleaning and drying and everything like that, but it doesn't take much moisture trapped in a weird space in an electrical system to cause a fire. So 
you know, we're, we're trying to keep a close eye on things there. I think because we do have a continuing authorization right now from FEMA to continue with category B. Now, if something failed right now and we had to repair it, that'd be a pretty complicated conversation with FEMA. So for most of the structures, I think the conversation would be, um, I don't know that we would automatically move into repairing that so we could get, keep people in the building. I think like say the electronics in 109 failed, I think we would pause and take a beat, make sure there was no damage being created by that failure, right? That there was no fire or anything like that, um, but stop before spending more money on repairs. I think the immediate repairs that we conducted, I feel safe that, that those will be FEMA approved and, and authorized. Uh, a re-repair at this point might be an uncovered expense. And I would, I think we would probably stop and, and come to talk to the committee about that before going down that road. I would almost treat that as a more permanent repair situation. Thanks. Um, it could depend on the, but luckily there were no structures I'm aware of that were related to like 24 hour facilities or like, you know, you know, if it were something that happened in a hospital, then that would be a different story. But I don't think we have any structures like that that were damaged in the flood. Mm -hmm. Okay, another question. Um, I was just thinking more about, and this is maybe more for Commissioner Fitch, but whatever you can speak to here. I was just thinking more about the loss of, you know, some material, you know, loss of things that, things like historic materials under the state curators uh, watch that really shouldn't have been in these basements. Um, and, you know, I, I know there's no one has bad intentions or anything, but, you know, but stuff was lost that's it's sad. Yes. And I want to just take a minute and, just acknowledge that and ask, is there, can we expect any um, you know, reporting or transparency or sort of stock taking on, on that aspect? Of so Vermont Emergency Management is going to be conducting an after action review of the flood event, but they're conducting that. And I still have to look through exactly their process and all their intentions, but they are emergency managers, right? They're focused on the immediate response, the immediate short-term recovery, I believe they're most likely to conduct that review in that context. So I think there are elements that that after auction review won't cover in, in the storage of historic materials um, below the floodplain level is one of those. So I do think I'll need to augment their after action review with um, some things that aren't as related to the immediate protection of, of life they don't, they do protection of property, but not historic property, right? I, I think they would miss that nuance. So potentially SOPs, standard operating procedures for recommendations for such? Um, yeah, potentially, um, yeah, potentially some policies or yeah, policies or SOPs. I think with Waterbury, I mean, still in the basement, mm -hmm. so problem solved. Can't store anything down there. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's what we did. Poured a lot of concrete. <clears throat> well, thanks. I look forward to seeing you out in your future report. I am trying to. Um, so there, there is there are a couple different reporting efforts underway. One is related to the work we're doing with FEMA. Um, I'm trying to make sure that's that's valuable and not just a very large document. Um, and I think there's a lot. There's still too many things that are preliminary or estimated, Madam Chair. And I apologize for that. It's fine. No, I but I, I think for next legislative session, I do think um, we'll have to. I am going to be working towards, okay, what, what kind of more robust report, both for the legislature and for Vermonters, can we, can we prepare to capture a lot of this? There were, I think, two reports issued after Irene that were in that kind of nature. Um, and I do think they were valuable. 
here. And should we have the storm like they're predicting today, how well prepared are we? We're <laughs> kind of snow right now. What's yeah. yeah, it's supposed to get bad. It's supposed to get much worse around 7 p.m. tonight. The wind levels are um, going to be particularly sense. dangerous. Um, so uh, I think our preparation level is rather high. Um, you know, one small, small silver lining of July was that in the December event, we were in a, in a good footing to, to respond very quickly to that event and to take um, actions. Um, the downside of these cumulative events, one downside among many, is that our storm water, our storm drain apparatus across the state, um, we cleaned out many of them, but in some cases, there's de there's still debris, there's still things. So they can these can be compounding events. Um, we should be okay if we don't get a heavy thaw, but the nature of the snow we've had recently isn't heavily moisture laden. So the snow that's out there right now is mostly powder. If that melted, um, there's, is it the Wollumsack River? That's down in my tent area. That is predicted to hit minor flood stage. Yes, I know. Yeah. Uh, so, um, our level of readiness is, is good, but some of the damage to our infrastructure isn't helping us right now. It's a challenge to so. Yeah. Anything else? Well, Doug, I'm sure you'll be coming back in. Yes. <laughs> um, more conversations. So I appreciate you spending time with us this afternoon. It was a good chunk of time, two and a half hours. I really appreciate it. Um, Thank you. Else. Add one last thought, Manager. Uh, the one thing I am hoping will be clear in the budget, and I can talk about it after the budget address, is how are we going to come up with the match for the whole event, for the hazard mitigation work? How are, how are we going to balance that? Um, but with a focus, of course, on yeah, my mind. making sure that... Uh, Where's the money coming from? Right. Yeah. That was really at the top of it. <laughs> we were right there for the Waterbury Complex. So thank you. Thanks, Doug. Thank you. Thanks, for the committee, we're we're done for the day for you two. So we can go off of YouTube. Yeah. So we're done. We'll see everyone on YouTube tomorrow morning at eight thirty.